Welcome to the Strong Single and Human podcast, a real look at single parenting, how to navigate the ups and downs of life with kids on your own while keeping sane. We cover all manner of subjects from domestic violence, dealing with childhood trauma, through to fussy eaters and how to help your kids become resilient. I'm your host, Claire Martin. Welcome. For over 19 years, this week's guest, Emily Levy, has been operating EBL Coaching, which specialises in one-on-one home and virtual tutoring for students in grades prep to 12. She is on a mission to get many more individuals with disabilities the best and most appropriate academic support that they desperately need. Emily is a consistent advocate for those with learning and attentional challenges and wants to get the word out to the world so they too can enjoy her campaign. So, a bit of background. Emily is an educational expert, business owner, public speaker and author based near New York City. She holds both a master's degree in special education and a doctorate degree in education from Nova University. Emily's five-year research study on alternative strategies for teaching reading comprehension found her winning a fifth place Westinghouse Science and Talent Award in 2017. And she was selected as one of Birkin County's Commission on the Status of Women Honorees during Women's History Month. She has spoken nationally and internationally on various educational topics in the US and writes regularly for educational publications. This is the Strong, Single and Human podcast. Hi, Emily. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. No, thank you for coming on board, right? You're such a busy person. It was really hard to get you um on the podcast but thank you for giving us the time and coming on board my pleasure happy to be here thanks shall we start with telling our listeners a little bit about your story and how how you got to where you are and this research that you've been doing and you know all of the things that you're doing for kids with learning difficulties Absolutely. Well, I am currently the founder and director of EBL Coaching, which is a one-on-one tutoring program where we work with students who have special education needs in helping them to build their core academic skills, reading, spelling, writing, math, study skills. And we help students not just in the local New York, New Jersey area, but we help students nationally and internationally now for a wonderful virtual platform that we've developed over many years. Um, in terms of how I got started, I actually grew up in the field of special education. My mother was actually the founder of a school for students with learning disabilities down in Florida, which is where I'm from and where I grew up. Wow. So yeah, so I really spent most of my childhood working at her school, observing teachers, working with kids and absorbing all of these wonderful methods that she used for helping kids with learning challenges that I pivoted into my own business. So after I went to college, I went to Brown University, I decided to carve my own path and actually did finance for two years, kind of the opposite of education. Uh, but really, well, that was what I was going to say. Yes. Was there ever a point where you went, oh, this is all right and it's great, but I don't actually want to do this. I want to do something else. A hundred percent. So I pretty quickly realized that it wasn't my calling. What's interesting is I did learn a lot of great skills from my work in finance that I still use today in terms of being comfortable with numbers and money and all that good stuff. Yeah. But really, it wasn't my passion. So during my second year of finance, I started tutoring kids on my own all around Manhattan that had special education needs. So I'd work all day in finance and then literally run from one apartment to the next to the next all evening, all weekends until it became too much. And I said, okay, leave this finance job and started tutoring myself full time. And then when my time ran out, I just started to organically bring on different tutors who specialize in different areas and eventually grew EBL coaching into what it is today. Wow. Wow. What a journey. What a journey. So, so let's actually go like, let's 
go back a step because I'm wondering if people actually understand what learning difficulties actually mean. Because we're not just, we're not talking about dyslexia, although that is a learning difficulty, right? So what, what are, what are some of the common learning difficulties? Many different types of learning disabilities. There's dyslexia, which is really more specific to reading. There's dyscalculia, with, which is specific to math. There are some students that have learning disabilities in writing. There's ADHD, which often comes with a lack of organization and focus, executive functioning challenges. So there really are many different types of learning disabilities. And the only way to really come to that diagnosis would be to have a full evaluation done. Oh, completely agree. Completely agree. I mean, you can't just go, oh, my kid's got ADHD. You need to actually really go and have it all assessed because because it's not as simple as just maybe one learning difficulty, is it? Well, that's the other piece. Many students have a combination of both. They call it comorbidity, where it might be dyslexia and ADHD or learning disability in reading and writing. So that is very common that there's more than one. Mm. Is there a learning difficulty? Is there a learning difficulty for being able to read people's names? Because I'm horrendous at reading people's names. I cannot. I look at it and I add letters into the name. Right? I'm not dyslexic, but sure. for names, I'm horrendous. Well, I wouldn't say there's a learning disability specifically for names, but sometimes difficulty with decoding words can be part of a global learning disability. Or some people just have trouble with that skill. Just names. I'm all right with the reading malarkey, but names I'm horrendous with. But that's okay. All right. So cool. So what? So if what are the some of the, for want of a better word, symptoms um, of these of your child having a learning um, difficulty if they haven't been diagnosed, right? So if they haven't been diagnosed with dyslexia and things like that, it's not. Uh, the, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm assuming rightly or wrongly, but that because the child, one, you don't know what they've got and as a parent and the child definitely doesn't know and they're not going to be able to go, oh, well, and explain really concisely <laughs> what's going on, right? Um, because, you know, they might be five, six or whatever and not understand it. So what are some of the symptoms that's a long-winded way of saying what are some of the symptoms, sorry. Okay, that's what okay. What are some of the symptoms sure. that you could look out for regarding learning difficulties, ADHD, and, I mean, there's many, I'm sure. But, you know, what what would be, I think I've got a problem here and I need to go and get my child assessed sort of sure. symptoms. Well, there are many different early warning signs, so to speak, of different types of learning disabilities. So, for example... For young children who might be entering kindergarten and really have struggled to learn to recognize the names of the letters, their corresponding sounds, recognizing numbers, being able to write their name, write basic letters. If there's a history of a speech delay, speech challenge, some of these could be warning signs that there might be a deeper learning disability going on. In terms of ADHD, if the child really struggles to stay focused on the ta on a task is completely disorganized, has no concept of time, is always late and forgetful. These could all be potential signs of ADHD. Many evaluators won't really give a diagnosis before age six or so because they say it could okay. be developmental. But I would say these are definitely early warning signs. And if a parent is noticing them, they may want to look into either having an evaluation done or really tracking it for a little bit and then having an evaluation done when they're able to find an evaluator to do so. Yeah, when they're a bit older. Um, and, I mean, there's a lot of this in the media at the moment, especially in Australia, where we've got um, females, ladies, who are 40, 45, 50, who are now discovering that they've got like ADHD or autism or, you know, they've got some, I don't want to call it, it's not an issue, but it's a superpower. Let's call it a superpower that isn't like, um, that's a different superpower from everyone else, right? Um, so are, are females harder to diagnose or um, is it just that it manifests differently in them or? 
Well, females traditionally tend to almost fall through the cracks a little bit more because they don't always make noise or act out or have the same kind of behavior challenges that many do. Right. So oftentimes they just kind of fall through the cracks and they move from one school year to the next, even though they have these real difficulties because they're not making this kind of noise, they often don't get diagnosed the way that boys do. The other interesting piece that I see often is that when an adult woman or man has a child that has a diagnosed learning disability, a lot of times the light bulb goes off and says, you know what, that was me as a kid. And that then triggers them to have an evaluation done wow. to then discover that they have the same learning disability. And many of these learning disabilities are hereditary. Well, that was what I was going to ask, right? Like, are they hereditary or is it, um, it's not, um, genes, it's uh, environment or whatever. So it, 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 we're finding that they're hereditary now. Yes. Many learning disabilities are hereditary. Of course, not every child is going to get one, so to speak, but there, there's very much a, a connection, a hereditary connection. And I think when many adults were younger, it wasn't as common to be evaluated to, there weren't as many evaluators. It wasn't talked about as much. So I think there's much more awareness around the learning disabilities and how having that diagnosis, especially at a young age, can really help a child so much in giving them the right support to get them through their academic journey. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I agree. And um, oh, I had a question that just popped into my head there and then it's just popped out again. So, um, yes, no. So, um, okay. So can the schools and do the schools help in recognising these learning dis difficulties because, um, and should they be highlighting them back to the parents? Because I'm thinking, I, if my child was going to school, and let's face it, the school has him five days a week for six hours a day or whatever, I would be expecting them to be coming to me and saying, hey, excuse me, you know. So do schools actually do assessments of children so themselves the answer, as such? The answer is yes, absolutely. Every child has the right to have a free evaluation done. And if there is a diagnosis, the school has an obligation to provide services based on that diagnosis and based on the child IEP. Now, sometimes it is a matter of a parent advocating for ch ch their child and saying, I'm really noticing the struggle. I want my child to be to be evaluated rather than waiting for the school to pick up on an issue, which sometimes happens much later than when a parent would realize it. Yeah. And is it best to catch these um, these learning difficulties as early as you possibly can and then monitor the progression? Absolutely. Without a doubt, there's so much research that tells us that the earlier we can diagnose it and start to treat a learning disability, the better it is for the child. So, OK, so what are the potential impacts if it does get missed or um, or and like a lot of people who listen to this as single parents, right? Or if you've got one parent who's going, I think there's something wrong with my child, right? And or our child. Sorry, slip of the tongue. And um, <laughs> and uh, then the other parents going, no, nah, they're fine. And they're in complete denial that there's anything wrong, right? Um, what are some of the impacts that can happen for that child? Well, the impacts can be pretty significant. So in the beginning, they might not be as glaring. But as a child progresses through school and the demands of school start to increase so much, they have to... They shift from learning to read to reading to learn. They start to have to write more complex paragraphs, do complex math. They start to really struggle academically and just they can't pass their quizzes and tests. They can't complete their homework on their own. So there's a big struggle, not just academically, but oftentimes their self-esteem just gets crushed. They don't feel smart. They see their peers excelling. And it really has that mental health impact in addition to those academic struggles. So it's a complete disservice, not having a child evaluated and really giving them the support that they need. Yeah, because I suppose it leads to a lot, I suppose in a way, it leads to mental health issues then because they get depressed, um, you know, they then feel maybe that they're not good enough and it's not that they're not good enough, they just learn differently, right? Um, 
and um yeah that's it could be a hell of a challenge and and i suppose it gets worse the older and older they get like into their teen years when it's like the most impressionable time of your life where you're like everything is affecting you and hormones are going off and things like that so yeah Definitely. And sometimes, unfortunately, many of them get into substance abuse and alcohol abuse because it's an escape for them. So it really can trickle down to a very deep hole if it's not addressed early on. And then so and with that, OK, would you um, and you're not and I have to say a caveat here, right? You're not advising anyone, but like some physicians um and people say, oh, if your child has ADHD or a learning difficulty or whatever, it's best to best to um, give them medication um, and that should help them, right? So, like, some people don't like to do the medication avenue, but is it really on the advice of your practitioner or your, your physician, um, whomever, as to whether it would be an advantage? Because do does... Does, med does medication help all the children or can it hinder some? It's a, it's a very tricky one and sometimes a sticky mm. subject because there are many parents that are adamantly against medication. They will not under any circumstances give medication to their child. My philosophy is if a child has such significant challenges that they just cannot sit in class, they, they are not learning because their mind is all over the place, they're completely distracted and they're getting nothing out of school, in my mind, that's time to perhaps explore trying medication on perhaps a trial basis because the child's just going to miss out on more and more and more if they're not able to stay focused to that degree in class. Yeah. It's just my personal opinion. Some parents do not agree with that and they will not medicate their child. But unfortunately, I've seen many. And that's fine. Yeah. And that's fine. It's a personal choice. That's just my own opinion on the matter. Oh, look, and, and speaking from personal experience, my um, eldest stepdaughter um, has ADHD and she said she nearly cried when she was given medication because everything calmed down for her. And she was like, wow. So this is what other people experience. Yeah. Um, and it was so like, and she said, wow, this is awesome. Um, she could focus and, and you know, go through her studies and things like that. It was a lot easier for her to cope with it. So um, that's a positive story. I don't know if there's any negative. I'm happy to hear from anyone with a negative story. Um, but yeah, okay. So what do we do for our kids um, that can help them? Like, Obviously, we could engage with with somebody like yourself that can give us tips and tools to help them, right? Um, but it, you know, it is up to us parents to also help and um, you know, bring our children along on this journey. Um, so, what can we do? Well, first off, I believe that parents should always be advocating for their child on an ongoing basis, not just in the beginning when they receive the diagnosis or receive an IEP, but every single year and during the course of the year, they need to constantly be evaluating how is my child doing? Is he or she getting the right support? If not, let me contact their teacher. Let me contact their guidance counselor, their team who's involved in helping them to see what we can do to change things. And again, Every year, there could be new challenges that come about. So I think just constantly looking at your child, seeing how they do are doing and advocating for them on an ongoing basis. And then I, I feel that if what they're getting at school just isn't quite enough and they're still struggling, sometimes it really is helpful to have some outside providers come in, whether it's a tutor or a speech therapist or any other kind of therapist, to give them that additional guidance and support just to help them that much more through their journey. Yeah, because look, at the end of the day, you're bringing your child on um, and giving them the extra help um, so that hopefully you're helping them to not be bullied at school, to not be, you know, stand out from the rest as such. Um, although I'm an advocate for standing out from the rest, but um, when you're at school, it's not the best place to be standing out from the rest. It can be a cruel, harsh, harsh place to be. Yes. Um, but yes, and, and I suppose number one before any of this is if you are concerned, go and get a diagnosis or try and get a diagnosis or an idea um, 
And then it's a really around researching. Is there anywhere that people can actually, a good places for people to actually get more information? Obviously, your website. Sure. <laughs> Uh, which is which is w which is w dot um e b l uh, l coaching e b l coaching dot com isn't it e b l coaching dot com you yeah. got it dot com yeah yeah so obviously go there because that's you know that's a good place to start um but then is there is there any other places like I'm I'm, I'm thinking there's associations for ADHD and things like that. Definitely. Yeah. Well, there's a CHAD is a great, C-H-A-D-D is a great organization for ADHD. Oh, okay. The International Dyslexia Association has a tremendous amount of research. LD Online has some great articles about parenting. So I'd say those are good sites that parents can check out to learn more about these challenges. Yeah. And like, are you, do you see... And I'm wondering if you don't, because you've got parents who are coming to you who are saying, I need extra help. But do you see certain um, issues that parents actually face when their child actually first gets diagnosed? Are there certain emotions that the parent will go through? Sure. Uh, Many of them actually feel a sense of relief when they have a diagnosis And which is interesting because they feel like, finally, I know what's going on with my child and I know that there are options for how to help them. Now, other parents feel this constant struggle that it's just, it's never enough. My child's constantly struggling. It can be very stressful on a parent and on families to have those ongoing challenges. So it's definitely a mix of emotions, but the good news is there are so many resources available now that once they have that diagnosis, there's a lot of different avenues they can turn to get help for their child. And then also I'm thinking, are there avenues that they can get help for them as well? Because I'm I'm thinking that you would be going through a few emotions like, did I do this to my child? Is there something I did in pregnancy? Is there something I did before I even thought about getting pregnant? It, you know, um, you know, all of these emotions that I'm thinking they're going through. So it's a, is there support for the parents as well? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of support groups. There's tons of Facebook groups and groups on social media where parents get together and they brainstorm different ideas. So there absolutely are a lot of resources and a lot of support groups for parents. Cool. Cool. That's good. That's good. Cause I, like, I think you may have a child with learning difficulties. You may have learning difficulties yourself as the parent, because like you said, a lot of them are hereditary. And then also you're also going to be going through emotions as well as a parent. And it's about looking after you first, like putting that mask on you first, like in the airplane scenario, as well as then helping your child so that if you have the information and you are in a healthy place, then you'll be in a healthy place to help your child. Absolutely. And it's, and let's face it, it's not a blame thing, right? It's something that's happened and occurred and like, you can't change it. One, although I was going to ask you, right? So if you have a child diagnosed, early diagnosis, say five, six or whatever, right? And they start to go into puberty, does puberty make it worse or does the hormone changes improve anything? Do we know? I mean, I don't know if we know. Is there anything about hormone changes that affect? As far as I know, hormone changes and puberty do not affect learning disabilities or ADHD in and of itself. However, of course, there's a lot of emotional changes that go on with puberty, Mm. which might exacerbate feelings of depression or anxiety or low self-esteem, which sometimes do come with learning disabilities and ADHD. So there may be that connection and that piece there. Wow. Wow. That's full on. That's full on. Um, So what is it that your guys do? So if I was a parent and I had a child and um, my child had a learning dif- difficulty and I went, oh, I'm going to phone EBL coaching, right, and say, oh, my child's got, let's call it ADHD, right? Uh, my child's got ADHD. Can you help me? What would you? Go- what would your company, your business be able to do? Sure. 
Well, our specialty is providing one-on-one -on -one academic tutoring to students who have these types of learning and attentional challenges. So typically as a first step, we really like to understand what is going on with the child and really have a nice lengthy conversation with the parents to understand the challenges that they've been facing. How long have they been facing these challenges? How are they manifesting themselves academically? So we can really figure out the best way to tackle them. And then usually from there, we like to do our own evaluation of the child, which is typically done virtually. So children can be anywhere in the world. I just evaluated a boy from Indonesia um, to really give oh, us, wow. yes, that was an interesting <laughs> one, to give us a picture of the child's specific needs. If they have any other evaluations or IEPs, usually we like to, to read those as well. And then from there would match the child with one of our learning specialists. Now we have learning specialists that specialize in early childhood reading challenges in high level math difficulties and organizational skills and executive functioning skills for teenagers. So we have different specialists who specialize in different skill areas. And then we would come up with a diagnostic plan of action to work on remediating and building those academic skills that the student is having difficulty with. And one thing to note is that all of the work that we do is research-based and multi-sensory and very much catered to the needs of each student. Cool. And do you connect in with like the specialists that would actually be dealing with um, the child, like the psych or the speech therapist or, or because like, um, and, and all like with autistic children, they might have a speech therapist, they might have a psych um, and things like that to actually do the ongoing assessments and things. Do you connect in with them? Do you do a report so they can see progress? I, what, how do you communicate? Yeah, we find the more we can work as a team, the better. So yes, yeah. we find it very helpful to reach out and stay in touch with any other therapist, any other teachers that are also working with the child to make sure we work as a team and doing what's best for that child. Yeah, no, awesome, awesome. What a lucky kid to have all those people working towards just getting them through life. Absolutely. It's fantastic. No, it's a gift. It's fantastic. Think of it. No, no, I, and, and let's face it, I mean, you know, the children, they, it's, they've they just got a different superpower from everyone else and that's okay. That's great. I mean, uh, you know, ADHD children, although they don't focus on lots of things, if they're passionate about something, really drill down and focus on the one thing that they love. And um, and sometimes I sit there and wonder if we shouldn't actually follow their, follow their example and just do what we're passionate about and... Uh, not do the boring mundane stuff that we have to do every day but then I suppose the world wouldn't go round so I don't know well, we need all these different people we do and some of the greatest leaders and entrepreneurs and visionaries of the world have ADHD and they end up hiring people to do those mundane tasks that they're yeah. not able to do and that's exactly. we need people like that in this world exactly Elon Musk is a very good example I yeah. suppose yeah. um but there we go um oh no look thank you Thank you for coming on board, Emily, and, and speaking to us and just giving us a bit more of an insight into the learning difficulties and what you guys actually do. Um, I do have one final question for you. Um, so I'm going to be interested to see how you answer this um, with all your experience and everything that you've done, right? What is one piece of advice that somebody's giving you, given you and that you use still to this day? Well, I would have to say, uh, you know, to never let, it sounds cliche, but to never let a failure stop me. I think that my attitude, and I've had a, many challenges, I think running any kind of business or any career really constantly have failures and challenges. And the way I look at things, and, and maybe I've been taught this along the way, is instead of dwelling on what I did wrong, I really try to look, I accept that I did it wrong, and I try to really look at what did I do wrong? What can I do differently next time and learn from it and then let it go? And that really helps yeah. me to continue to move forward. It's not get stuck on these moments of challenge that are very easy to fall into and to just learn from it, let it go and move on. And I think that's really helped me a lot. I love that you say, let it go as well, right? Because a lot of the time people go, oh, I've, I've made a mistake and I'll, I, what do I learn from it, right? But it's also then letting go of it, right? Yes. So toxic to keep mulling over a mistake that you've made um, instead of really just 
letting it go. It's happened. It's in the past. Yes. You can't change it. It happened. Yeah. Let it go um, and move forward. Um, but letting it go, yeah, it's, it's very, very essential um, and good advice. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. No, um, I th- love it. This is great. Thank you. Um, yeah, look, I hope that the information you've given has um, given some people some insight and um, given them some hope and basically uh, some confidence to go. And if they think something's not quite right um, and, you know, their child is not learning in the way that other children are, uh, because they have this different superpower, then, um, then yeah, just go and see what superpower they've got, whether it's the ADHD superpower, the dyslexia superpower, um, and, um, yeah, just go and get it diagnosed so we can do something about it. Cool. Well, look, I'll let you get on with your day, evening, evening, I think, from where you yes. are. And, um, yeah, thank you so much for having me it's been a real pleasure thanks for listening if you've enjoyed this podcast and you would like to hear more please hit subscribe wherever you like to hear podcasts if you would like to support us further share this episode with your friends and family and finally drop us a review on itunes as i'd love to hear your thoughts comments and ideas It all helps me to understand and produce awesome content you want to hear just like this. If you want to check out our past episodes, write to us, appear on the podcast, or for links, resources, and show notes, go to our website, www.strongsingleandhuman.com. We are also on all the usual social media platforms, Insta, Facey and Twitter. I hope you have a wonderful week and I hope to see you back here again soon. Be kind to yourself and remember, no one is perfect. We're all just putting one foot in front of the other and doing our best. I'm Claire Martin and you've been listening to the Strong, Single and Human podcast.